So I'm going to go ahead and launch Lightroom. And it's probably going to act, because I've not used it in here, it's probably going to act like it's a brand new situation. And that's a good thing, actually, because I want to go from step one, how do, we, how do we work with this catalog? Okay, so first thing it's going to say, hey, there's no catalog, right? And we've got a couple of different choices. We create a new catalog, and then we still got to come up with the issue of how are we dealing with images in one location and working in a different location. So um, I'm going to talk about a couple different options that you have for managing Lightroom catalogs in multiple locations. Okay. Second issue we have is how many images do we keep in a catalog? Theoretically, we can keep hundreds of thousands of images in a catalog. And what is the difference between Lightroom and Bridge? Bridge is not a database, it is a file browser. We can see images, we can preview images, we can even edit images in Camera Raw in a non-destructive manner, but in terms of cataloging and searching and retrieving imagery, it's a very inefficient tool as compared to Lightroom. So I just, I want to go from the ground up and talk about how do we use Lightroom to be productive. Well, here's the thing. I'm going to present a basic overview of what I think is appropriate for a photojournalism class, and you will figure out your own system, your own path, so to speak, because one of the things, I don't want you to get lost in the details to the point where it keeps you from being productive. Okay? I want you to know enough, and I trust that over time, you will dive deeper and deeper into these various technical precision issues as you go along, as you master a certain workflow. What I'm just going to talk about is a real basic workflow. I will tell you for myself, um, I haven't fully resolved all the issues with working with Lightroom catalogs in that I haven't decided whether or not I may adopt a multiple catalog approach and divide my work by type of work into separate catalogs. It's probably where I'm headed simply because I see the overhead. I create a 31,000 image library and that's not all my images. That's just what I've cataloged to date and I find it to be somewhat slow. So now I've got to rethink, well, do I want to keep multiple catalogs and break things up by a certain category of work? Not project per se, but category of work whether I, I treat a client-based commercial work as a separate catalog from personal and fine artwork. I don't have an answer yet. We all have to come up with our own answer. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say, all right, this is my first catalog, and I, I'm going to pretend I'm in my home office, and I'm going to create a catalog. So I'll choose a different catalog. And then I'm going to create a new catalog because now I can control where I save that catalog. So you'll notice instead of just saying use default catalog, I said no, I'm going to choose a different catalog. But I don't have any catalogs loaded here yet. So I'll create a new catalog. And then I'll decide where do I want it. Do I want it in my um, network account? So this would be my picture uh, folder underneath my Ira G user account, which here on campus is a network account. So there, this picture folder is not actually stored on this computer. It's stored on a remote server. I'm not sure I want that. Okay, On a Macintosh, if I go into users, Shared is actually the only account here on campus where it's actually not shared over a network, but it's on the local hard drive. It's kind of ironic that the term for describing a local hard drive folder where we can store things as shared, even though it's actually not on a server, it's on the local machine. I could put it there. And in fact, that's where I'm going to put it today, just for today. So I'll just call this uh, my catalog, Ira 
I'll just call this Ira PJ catalog. And I'll create a new folder in the shared area and put my name on it for now. I'll hit create. And I'll let Lightroom continue to, to load. Ira, while it's opening, can I just ask a very basic question? I think yes. That I need to explain. The collection is inside a catalog, right? The catalog is like a book, and then, you know, like in the old days, the catalog is the book, and then inside are little collections, right? That's what, exactly what the catalog and collection are. I would describe it slightly different. I would say the catalog is my file cabinet and my collections are my file folders inside the cabinet. That's the way I would look at it. Now, you'll notice Lightroom is starting to develop um, networking capabilities of syncing with your iPhone, your iPad, etc. I'm going to go ahead and say sure, I'll enable it. However, it says enable sync for new collections. Um, actually, I'm going to turn that off for right now, and I can sync up later on. What that will do is it will take certain collections and put it on a cloud storage, make it available in my um, Adobe Creative Cloud account on multiple devices. We're moving towards the world where uh, just yesterday I'm listening to a podcast, Dell Computer went from being the second largest manufacturer of desktop computers to uh, being a publicly traded company to a, a year and a half ago they became private again uh, and they're re-emerging as a cloud computing company, right? So right now, if you, that, that's where the money is in the tech sector is cloud storage. And so we have all these, these ways of doing cloud storage. We have Dropbox as a cloud storage. Google Drive as a cloud storage. Adobe is now going to build their version of cloud storage that is built into their products. But it's not quite there yet. Um, and right now it's only syncing collections rather than catalogs. And that's a whole infrastructure. I will tell you, saving over the cloud can be a very uh, time-consuming process. So for speed, I'm going to say, I'm going to turn that off and I can sync it later and deal with that issue a little bit later where I maybe have a project and I'm going out of town. I'm going to go, oh, I'll throw all those images into a collection, sync that up over the cloud, and I'll get to it through Adobe. Or I'll show you what I actually do. So I'll hit continue. Okay. First time you open it, it starts trying to help auto drive, right? Tech assist here by saying click the import button to begin. So I'm going to put in my CF card into a CF reader. And I'm going to import. So I'll hit the import button. Now you'll notice OS 10 wants to use what used to be known as iPhoto is now just built into the operating system as photo. So if you're using anything newer than uh, I think OS 10.9 is when they started doing this uh, where it's no longer a separate application. iPhoto is just called Photos, right? And when I plug in a CF card reader or an SD card reader, the operating system says, hey, I recognize this as a collection of photos. Do you want to bring this into the photo system? I recommend we don't do that. Okay, That's a very messy way of handling imagery. Uh, and so I'm not going to do that. And I'll go back to Lightroom. And here I am in my import module. And I have a number of choices in here. My first set of choices, where do I want the files to be? and my destination. So right now the destination is wanting to go into my picture folder and I'm actually not going to put those there at this point. Uh, the images do not get stored in the catalog. The catalog is the separate file. Okay, the cat That's why Lightroom is both powerful and dangerous at the same time. The Lightroom catalog does not store images. It stores links to images and keeps track of where they are. It allows us to make edit decisions with images, but it actually 
does not store the images in the catalog. I can make edit decisions that are non-destructive, that it's not until I say, okay, go ahead and process that image, that it actually will open up the image, process it, and export it and save it with that edit. There, there we go, there's the shared folder here, right? And then I'll get to my folder here in shared. And it wants to put them in a setup based upon the year and then the date in there. And that works for me, actually. I'm fine with that. So I'll go ahead and, and the destination will be shared. Up here under file, um, I have the opportunity to build smart previews. Um, and I have the ability to say, don't import any suspected duplicates. Now, if I'm photographing and bringing images directly off my card, I shouldn't have any duplicates to worry about. However, if you're building a database from an existing hard drive full of images, there's a good chance there's duplicates. So it's nice for it to not import uh, duplicates. Um, if I did want to import duplicates, it would make a second copy to a different location. Okay? I could have it added immediately to a collection. So if this was just files from one photo shoot, I wanted to create a collection, I would do that. I'm not going to because I've got a variety of images here because like most photographers, I shoot quite a few days in a row and then try to get to my post-production after I'm back in town. So for me, these are mostly images taken down in Portland and there were multiple days, different shoots, different bodies of work. So I'm not going to make a collection immediately. Um, I could go in and do a rename file at this point and that actually is not such a bad idea um, and I kind of like numbering things or using a date and a file name. Um, I could do a custom name if it was a wedding project I would go ahead and give it a custom name as I was importing it in um, but for now I'm pretty happy with just doing um, the date and file name because the date's going to keep it. The big issue with file naming is if you never rename your files over time you're going to reformat an, a CF card or an SD card and it's going to cycle back through and it's going to be the same image number and you're going to end up with two files with the same image number and it's going to create problems. So I generally avoid that by creating sub folders and also by renaming files. So I'm, I'm pretty uh, content to go ahead and rename that. I do have an issue about smart previews or not smart previews. The recommendation generally is to go ahead and have Lightroom create smart previews. They're a little larger file size, but what they allow you to do is if I move my catalog without copying all the photos with it, if I have a smart preview, I can continue to edit my images and then when I go back and load the catalog and have the access to the image uh, files, when they go back online, it will automatically sync those edit decisions. So I don't have to take 16 gigs or 100 gigs worth of images on the road with me. If I just take my Lightroom catalog with smart previews, I can do all my editing in Lightroom and the next time I'm hooked up to my hard drive with all the actual files, it will update all those images for me. So I kind of like smart previews. However, I will caution you, and again, Lightroom, the more you know, the more complex it becomes. The default preference setting is that smart previews get purged after so many days. They, because it, it, it is, adds a huge amount of volume to your data in your catalog. It just expands the file size. I, right now I have a Lightroom catalog that's about two gigabytes of data, right? So those smart previews add a lot of memory to it. Um, so that's the decision. You can always build smart previews after the fact and I can show you how to do that as well. Um, I'm still kind of following Terry White's recommendation to go ahead and just start out building smart previews just because I work not, my home office is where I like to do all my heavy intensive editing, but the reality is I spend a lot of time uh, remotely. 
And so for me to be able to work on images remotely makes sense. So I go ahead and do the, the smart previews uh, on there. Uh, other than that, I think I'm ready to import. Anything come to mind that Eric does differently? Keywords. He adds the keywords at that point as part of the import. That's cool. I guess I don't because I'm importing a, a different shoots all at the same time. So I'm going to do my metadata afterwards. Okay. Oh, the other uh, issue we didn't really talk about too is you do have the option to have your images converted to a DNG file, which is a generic um, raw file format. It's digital negative file format. The advantage to that theoretically is that you'll notice cameras will change their proprietary file formats on a fairly, reason, uh, fairly regular basis. Any images that are converted to a DNG file are kind of in this universal file format theoretically. The reality is I've never had an old file format become obsolete to where they don't just keep that file format. It's the new cameras that become the issue uh, more often than not. Um, the DNG file though is, is interesting because and the one advantage to converting to DNG that I know of, I don't do it yet. I haven't, it just takes more time up front than, and I tend to be impatient. The one advantage to the DNG file over not converting to DNG is that the um, metadata for the edit decisions is stored in a separate XMP file. And if that XMP file gets lost, I lose everything. DNG files store all the metadata in the DNG file. So you don't have two separate files, you have one larger file that has that metadata. That is a pretty powerful case, in my opinion, for switching over to DNG. I just, I've got so many existing files, I haven't adopted that to my workflow yet. It's something that I will probably start doing as I continue shooting here forward. Is that something he addresses? Okay. The big thing is DNG eliminates the worry about if I lose an XMP, what's known as a sidecar file, right? Because right now, if I go out and look at these images, they don't really make a good way to get to the users and shared areas. So I'm going to add that to my side here. You guys all know how to make shortcuts to get to your common places. Just drag it over here. So if I go in here, I probably don't have anything yet. Yep, I do. I got XMP files in here for every one of these. So as it imported it in, it create, it separates out the metadata and puts it in a sidecar file. So that is the one advantage to converting DNG is I wouldn't have that duplication of multiple files there. So now I have my images in here. And I'm going to do a couple of things. One, I'm going to create a collection and group these. And the first collection I'm going to do is a photo story, so to speak, of a student exhibit. So I'm going to just shift click and select those and I'm going to add a collection. And I will just name this. Uh, exhibition. Okay. So now I've got 84 uh, files in the collection. I generally start out making the collection first because now if I delete something out of a collection where I eliminate it, it's not deleted from the database, it's just deleted from that particular collection. Okay. So once I've done that and I've got my collection, I will generally do one of two things. I will do a keyword. So I'll select all these images and start giving it a keyword. Okay, and I'll put gallery exhibition.
Yes, absolutely. Um, and again, I am growing my understanding of keywords um, as we get more and more comfortable with the modern business model. And keywords are incredibly important for search engine optimization. So metadata, we don't yet have a way of searching for pixels. I mean, we have facial recognition software. We do have the ability to find images that look like some other image. That technology does exist. But by and large, in order to find an image on the internet, we have to search for the metadata text that's with it. Keywords are important because they fuel the search engine um, responses to queries. So when I upload and publish an image to a blog, a social media site, um, or I put it any, anywhere in a server on, that's connected to the network, those keywords become Boolean search operators. Uh, that's probably not the technically correct term. Boolean is not the right term. They become words that if anybody on the internet is searching for, that becomes part of the response to it. So keywording has become increasingly important to photographers to be able to sell their images. And in fact, if you work with, um, if you were a commercial photographer selling stock photos, there's app, uh, an application called Photo Quote that actually has a whole separate add-on module for keywording to help you manage your keywords to make your images more sellable as stock photos. So we've got keywords in here. I also have the dates of the images as well, and I have it in a collection. So I know I've got a number of ways that I can search for it. So now the issue becomes about ranking them. And so I want to see individual images and look through here, and this is where I use the star system to rank my images. Now I will tell you that I do two different types of ranking systems. If I'm doing a ranking for a photo essay, I use one system of ranking, whereby I use the number of stars to indicate the category of image. One would be an established shot, two would be a portrait, three would be an action shot, four would be a detail shot. So I have a way of grouping my images by categories of shots for a photo essay. And then what I do is I've reserved the five star as being the best image from each of those categories that I want to publish. That's one ranking system. If I'm just doing a, a portrait shoot where I'm not telling a complete story, it's really just for a client doing a photo shoot, I will use a, it's just the system that has evolved for me is I will go through and if I'm not sure if I want to keep it or not, I give it a one star. If I know it's a keeper but I'm not sure it's great, I'll give it a three star. And then I'll go back through and give five stars to the ones I actually want to show the client. Now we heard something interesting from Young Quack when he presented where he used ranking as a way to tell his editor which images were best. Because you don't generally get to talk to the editor of the images, you just upload them and they're there. He was able to control what the editor saw by ranking and by sequencing and putting them in the order he wanted them to. So when you export them, you can rename them to a sequence number. So I've got two ranking systems and let's just go through, this would be a portrait, right? So I would rank this two stars for the category portrait, okay? Now I can hit the stars manually with my mouse, or I can just hit the keypad, uh, the number, and it will, Lightroom's very efficient with ranking. So I can just go through and I go, oh, I like that one. I kind of like that one. I'll go ahead and rank it as a two. That's an action shot. So I'll give it a three, three. And I could go through and I could s select a group of them and rank them as a three. These are all action shots. I'll rank them as a three. Those are silhouettes that didn't work. I'm not going to bother ranking them. 
Those are more action shots. A rank is a three. This is all before editing, right? This is just your This is before. I'm just going through and organizing my photo shoot. That's a three. Okay. That's me trying to be creative. That's I'll make that a portrait. That's a two. Kind of a creative portrait sort of thing, right? Also, I can quickly rotate them by using the keystroke of command and the left bracket key to rotate a certain way. Okay, these are uh, that's a portrait, so that's a two. There's an action. That's a kind of, I would argue that that's, even though it's an action shot, I'm going to call it a portrait because it's really static. And what's really going on, it was about me seeing the reflection of the face looking back at her and as well as a reflection of the other person. So for me, I'm going to call it a portrait rather than an action shot. This is a gray area. Is it an action shot? Yes. Is it a portrait? Yes. I'm going to go ahead and call it a three. I'm going to call that a three. I'm going to call that a two because that's kind of a portrait. And I can rotate these later. Okay, there's action, action. Um, that's a detail shot. It's really not appropriate for this story, but hey, I was having fun. Again, I would call this a detail shot that's also got an element of portraiture because of the reflection of the viewer in the frame. I kind of like that myself. You can see I had an idea of what I was doing. That doesn't work. He's got a barrel in his eye. Um, that's not working. I, that's a detail shot, but it's not one I would probably use. So I'm just going to go through these quickly. And these are all interesting shots. And I'm going to call them portraits for right now. And I can always change the category later. But again, I just thought it was really interesting. Oh, there we go. Um, how the reflection was playing out. And these are candid photos. I didn't ask him to pose. That's definitely a detail shot of glass cleaner with all the framed artwork in the background. Okay. So those are all action sh or uh, detail shots, excuse me. Well, that's a good point because I don't really have a good establishing shot. That actually is a somewhat wider, again, it's a gray area, right? And then here's another detail shot. I try to get, I will tell you the establishing shot would be the exterior of the building. Where is it? Right? And I don't really have that shot. So, you know, the fact of the matter is I strive for all four of those categories. I try to keep them in mind. I don't always get it. And I guarantee you I don't ever publish four images it's a weird thing. I will almost always, I'll publish three, I'll publish five. I will almost never publish four because there's no way to lay it out on a page that doesn't divide the interest. We want asymmetrical balance. So the reality is I generally will drop one of the category shots off when I actually publish to a blog or publish to a printed page. I will include all of it in a slideshow, but that's a whole other lecture and I'm not going to worry about it right now. What I am going to worry about is now I've got the ability to filter by ranking. Okay? And I can change the ranking to an equal to to where I only see those that are two stars. Right? Now I will tell you that I will go through these images as quickly as possible and go which ones grab my attention and I will come in I see this group is uh, shot vertically and I'll flip those real quick and I'll go oh his eye doesn't work that kind of works I kind of like that one I mean that just doesn't okay um, Here's something important. Do you notice something that's not happening, even though I have them all selected? Not it's not changing the other two. It's only changing the one. Right down here. Right now, I have to manually sync. 
if I select this up to auto sync, whatever I do to the one image, the first image is automatically done to the other image. Now bridge never had to think about it, just automatically do things on rotation and automatically sync it. With Lightroom, I have to toggle that auto sync on in order to batch change the rotation of the images. Okay, so I kind of like that image. And I'm going to keep that as a five star consideration. So I'm just going to go through quickly which ones stand out to me. I think that one stands out. So I'm going to get a, a five star ranking and oops, there we go, which is going to make it disappear temporarily. That one doesn't work. That one doesn't work. It's kind of cool, but no. That one's too feels staged even though it wasn't because that smile. That one feels more candid, doesn't it? So I might keep that one and I'll come back and do editing later. Um, that one feels a little staged. It's the deer in the headlights. It's a cool image because of the toes and kind of the boyish charm of the, of the person in the image, but I think I like the other ones. So I think I'm going to move on to my next category and I'll go, all right, Let's go through these quickly. Notice the nose area here is fully separated from the sleeve. Here we've got a little bit of a merger and more separation with the, the white background there. I actually kind of like that one better. I'm going to give that a five just to hold on to it as a possibility. That one's kind of interesting. There's a lot of visual information. I can't see the artwork, but I can see the glass cleaner and I can see the person hanging it. I'll consider it. Um, here, I've got to rotate that one. And I just, as much as I love the concept of this, I think it's too blurry to use. So I'm going to drop it. I'm not going to use it. That one shows a relationship going on, which is kind of interesting, but. I, I'm going to go ahead and leave that one because it shows a relationship of two people working together. Now I'm going to go to the next category. I kind of like that one is visually interesting. I'll, I'll think about it. I like that one, but I feel like I have too many of the same person. I love that image. It says a lot. That one says a lot too. That one says a lot. That's kind of the establishing shot. And then now I'm down to my final selection here. So I haven't done any editing. Here's the challenge. It is easy to lose your time by editing too many images. Right? So I'm not going to edit all my images. I'm going to edit the ones that I think I might publish. This image I might publish. So I'm going to go through and say, which one am I publishing? Well, I like that one. I like that one. That one's fun, but it just doesn't work. So I'm going to downgrade it to um, back to its category. That one just doesn't work. That one just doesn't work compared to all the others, right? That one works pretty darn well. I'll keep it. I think that one works a little better than this one. What do you think? Yeah. Right? Oops, I think I screwed up though. I actually hit the wrong key. Uh, that's the one I want. There we go. And then let's go back to four, five star better. There we go. I've got that one and I don't want that one because the cross is too close to the merger there. So I'll go back. Yeah, I like that one, right? Yeah. So now I start thinking about I've got this one and I'll look at it in, a, in more of a grid mode in here and I'll go hmm I think that one says more combined with this one than this one does here so I think I'll go ahead and rank that back to its category this is your photo essay right? yeah photo yeah well, you're gonna pick four. I'm just going to narrow down to, to, to a few images that I'll actually submit okay and maybe that's what I'll submit to the editor right there remember what young quack said don't send me everything send me enough of a selection of what's interesting. So I've got these images here. Now I'll go ahead and move to the develop module. Okay? 
And I'm gonna turn off the tips. All right. So first thing I want to do is white balance. In this case, I didn't wasn't doing a stage portrait where I took a target and had a I had somebody to hold the target. So I'm going to use the white balance tool, and I'm going to select something that I think should be neutral. A gray measuring tape should be neutral, and in fact, it looks pretty darn good, right? Natural daylight coming in should be a little bit cool tone. Now I'm going to open up the shadows a little bit, okay? And I'm going to go down, and again, this would be one area that is a lot of debate. I happen to be, um, if I go into detail and effects, those two areas here, I happen to be somebody that likes a little bit of vignetting to pull the eye into the frame. I generally will vignette most images somewhere between negative 12 and negative 18 depending upon how bright the overall and how solid the overall backdrop is. The more solid the backdrop, the more the vignette is visible and apparent, the more uh, natural and organic and camouflaged it is, the less noticeable it is that I can go a little bit deeper with it. What was the first one you used? Um, the first tool was the white balance tool where I used the eyedropper. This is the basic correction of co uh, correcting uh, the white balance. So I'll click on the eyedropper and just select something in the scene that should be a neutral color cast. Why is that? Why is what? Why are you doing the white balance if you haven't said, I mean, if you have, like you said you didn't fix the background. So how do I usually shoot? I will shoot typically in raw mode on my digital camera <coughs> with the white balance set to auto white balance. The reason I do that is out of the box, I'll get close. I mean, automatic technology works reasonably well, probably 80%, it gets you about 80% there, right? The professional just has to get the rest of the way. So auto white balance makes it look reasonably good uh, under a wide variety of shooting outdoors, indoors, all, you know, it's happening so fast, I don't wanna be stuck playing with my menu. Right, so auto white balance. I don't care because the reality is I'm shooting in raw mode, and I can change that white balance afterwards to anything it needs to be. So I've I've got this white balance in here, and right now it's it's actually at 2950, and I'm actually going to bump that up manually to probably 3000. In fact, I can click here and just type in 3000. Okay. Because I'm under track lighting, incandescent track lighting, that's typically going to be 3200 Kelvin. But I've also got a lot of window light coming in here. And I like the juxtaposition of the cool tones of the daylight coming through and the warm tones of the incandescent track lighting. And as after this, as I'd come in and select all these other images and sync them. And I'm just going to uh, sync the basic. Uh, uh, the, the white balance at this point. I'll turn everything off. Check none. Hit so white should balance. Should I get in the habit to shoot like a gray or white card with photojournalism or no? No, absolutely not. Okay. You don't have time. The light conditions change too much, too rapidly. If I'm doing a portrait, yes, I shoot a gray card or I shoot a target, right? Okay. But for photojournalism, no. I'm just looking for something neutral in the frame, okay? And look at this. These look pretty darn good, right? Yeah. So I'm not going to worry about that. Um, I did not sync, I need to sync the rest, uh, this other one, so I'll sync that one. And that looks pretty good, however, my primary subject is now blue, and that looks better under the incandescent. So here's where I would actually think about using a correction brush, an adjustment brush, and I'd warm up the white balance. Now, I don't want to change the exposure, so I'm going to drop that back to zero. 
okay? But I'm changing the white balance. The adjustment brush is this tool right here. It makes me think of a, a cosmetic brush, right? And I'm just going to go in, and this is where I can do 90%. I can do 100% of what a photojournalist needs to do in Lightroom. Because I'm not removing anything. I'm not cloning anything. I'm just doing basic dodge burn, color balance, image sharpening, just the real basics. And that's all we're doing for this uh, presentation today. Lightroom is pretty powerful, though. I can do individual burn areas. And the only thing I'm doing here is I'm balancing out the color because I got multiple light sources going on. And even there, that's a kind of a gray area. I kind of pull it back to where it just feels a little more natural. Okay. So now that background looks pretty good. I'm going to go back to my basic editing here. And I'm going to pull my shadows up just a little bit in that background. See how that's just pulling that area up? But it's a universal shadow correction, so I'm not overly changing the image. Right? And then I'm going to come to my sharpening, and this is where uh, we get into the detail section. And we get into our sharpening. I generally set my radius for sharpening to 0.8 and I will tell you that we, if we're working with image capture files, camera raw files, we have to do some sharpening after capture. The images will always be a little soft. Now, what that number is, I mean, if I go in here, okay, and you'll see that I'm just adding noise by over sharpening. I'm not actually gaining any detail. There it's blurry. Now I'm seeing the green. So I think of this from my darkroom days, what it was like to focus an enlarger with a grain focuser. Where do I see the edge of the grain? Excuse me. I will tell you that most of the time my standard sharpening for just everyday uh, publishing is about 50. That at 50, I see the grain pretty sharp. If I'm going to print out and output to inkjet printer, I might increase the sharpening more if it's going on a, a soft textured paper. But in general, kind of my default is about 50 on the sharpness to get a clean image. Okay. Uh, I read one of the things I was shown in a previous class by someone was uh, it's either option or control for the sharpening. Uh, you adjust the sharpening, you just like the contour? It's the, um, it looks at the luminosity. Yeah, you can see if you hold down the option, it gives a luminosity version of it. And you can do the same thing with the radius. It's an alt key on the PC and it's an option key on the Mac. And you can see how the radius is getting a posterized effect. Now I will tell you that sharpening in Lightroom is going to be less um, destructive and it's going to be less noticeable than unsharp masking in Photoshop. So most of the time, if I'm making a print, I do take the image into Photoshop to finish sharpening. This is just for batch processing, basic sharpening. So thank you for bringing that up. That actually happens to be a video tutorial I watched just at about 8.30 this morning as I was refreshing. There's just so many variables with sharpening. I just have to admit to you what my workflow is, right? There's no one right answer. Yes? Uh, not just sidetrack, but are we going to have time to work? Or yes, we are. We are indeed. Okay, so I've ranked, I've selected, I'm going to select them all. I've done some basic color correction. Um, I need to go ahead and put some captions in. I will go all the way through this process. I will do the basic sharpening. I will export it. I will publish it. Then I will go test my published work. I look at it after it's published. 
If I see a problem, I take it down and fix it. The reality is I have to design my workflow for the norm. And the norm is if you're shooting accurately, your images are sharp. You know it in camera. You know, if you've got good glass, you've got good autofocus, you're probably sharp. Where it becomes difficult is if I'm really experimenting with shallow depth of field and I'm shooting f1.4, I will tell you that most of the time I will take the time to go one-to-one -one on those images. But general photo essay story where I'm, you know, f8 and b there, no, I'm not worried about it. And then I'll deal with it after I publish it and just do a fine check. Okay? This is almost comes back to what I consider the, the film editing approach of we do a radio cut, we do a fine cut, and then we do a final cut. So I'm just getting through to where I don't spend a lot of time until I get down to the very last images that, that the client really wants. Right? So I need to go in and get my metadata and uh, get my captions in here. So I've got my copyright already in here. I'm going to go ahead and put these as copyrighted and apply it to all of them selected. So this is where I can go ahead and say, you know, individually I can come into this image and put in a caption, April, and I need to check the spelling on this. Uh, 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 all before hanging artwork for the 2012 SFCC Photo Arts Club exhibit on April 3rd, 2012. Boom. So here would be another one, I'd come in, come in here, and I'm going to change that one actually, and this is going to be um, Will, oh what's Will's last name, you know what, I'll look it up on Facebook, Not Will, oh, Will Carpenter, there we go, so Will Carpenter adjust a framed photograph in preparation for the 2012 SFCC Photo Arts Exhibit held at Really Wine Cellars in downtown. Spokane. Okay, so here's where I would go ahead and caption the images before uploading them, is in the metadata panel, right? Now we've got keywords to apply to all the images, and then if it's photojournalism and I need specific captions, I go in and apply the specific captions. If I wanted, if I had a series of photos, I could apply the same caption to the series of photos. So I've got my ranking, I've got my uh, re reduction down to the best images. I've got my captions in. The last thing I need to do is export these images and I'll just go to File, Export and I export to a specific folder. Choose it. In this case I'm going to go ahead and put it where it's easy for me to find and create a new folder and say 2012 Pack Club Exhibit and choose that. I don't need a subfolder because this is just it. I don't need to add it to a catalog. Okay. And I'm going to export full-size JPEGs as a preset at maximum quality. All metadata. and I'll keep everything in the metadata and I don't need watermarking and I'll export
and it's going through the process of exporting those files. And they're being exported as what extension? J JPEG. JPEG. Yes. Okay. Now, I also want to point out there are some features in Lightroom that are designed for personal productivity, and we want to talk about this. There's some built in social media. You can set up a Behance account, and let me jump out of here for a moment. So Adobe, in its effort to support visual professional, uh, professional artists who work in visual media, has a, their own form of social media called Behance, which allows you to look for different types of talent. Theoretically, this is a place that people can go to look at portfolios and find new talent. Right? So if I am working as a marketing executive and I want to look for a graphic designer, I can come to Behance.net, go look at graphic design, and I can look at a portfolio. Okay, and see examples of the work. And it's just almost like a Instagram or a visual blog. What's the other blog that's very visual? Tumblr. Tumblr, thank you very much. Very similar to a Tumblr that way, right? The other thing that we can do is, we'll look at photography while we're at it. So there's all these different disciplines, but as a social media, this also becomes our ability to track other working professionals whose work we admire, see what they're up to, get creative inspiration. So you create a Behance Net account, and then in Lightroom, you can set up a preset and link your Lightroom to your Behance social media account. You can also do this to your um, Facebook account as well, so that I could then take images from any collection and apply it to my Facebook, just drag the photos over to Facebook and hit publish, and it will automatically load them to my social media for me. I can also set up different hard drive exports and I'll just say this is my uh, blog export and I will say I want to save it to a particular folder where I put all my blog and let's go to recent places go back to my folder here and I'll just call this my blog exports choose. I'll tell it to put it in a subfolder that I can go in and rename afterwards. I can tell it to rename the original file plus a custom name. So what I'll do is I'll do um, so I'll do file name and then I want to do a uh, custom and a sequence. Okay, so I hit done with that. And the custom word is going to be blog post. So that whatever the image is, I will know that it's a blog post image and it'll also have a sequential number as well. I don't want to accidentally name it the same file as the original file. I want to be able to look at it and go, oh, that's for a blog. I'm going to uh, limit the file size down here under image sizing. I'm going to limit it. In my case, for my blogs, I limit to 1,200 pixels per inch. I do this for two reasons. One practical quality is that most people are looking at my images on a smartphone or tablet which means they don't have that much real estate when you put it on a website that they're going to need to look at a 2,000 pixel image. The second practical reason is I don't want to upload an image that is printable. 1,200 pixel image means that if I divide those 1,200 pixels by 300 pixels per inch needed for a high quality photographic print, I'm saying the maximum file size they could print at is a 4 inch image. I'm not going to worry about that. 
I don't want people to download images that make them 5x7, 8x10, or larger, right? So I will go ahead and limit my uh, blog post images to about 1,200 pixels per, per image. Now I can come in here and grab these images. And let's say I'm going to pick just the three images for the blog post. I'm going to pick that one, that one, and it's a hard decision, isn't it? I'm going to pick that one. Even though I want that one, that's a really cool image. But the reality is that's somebody else's work that he's looking at. Here he's doing something. I drag that to my hard drive. Now I've got those three images, and all I have to do is uh, publish. Right here, I hit publish. And you'll see it work through. It's amazing how slow Lightroom is at this point, but it's doing a lot of backbreaking work for me. I believe the computer is the best coffee break machine ever invented. I feel like I'm still working as long as I see that uh, status bar moving from left to right. Okay, so there are other plugins that you can get. On my personal computer, I bought a plugin that allows me to upload to a professional Facebook page rather than my personal page, and it allows me every time I publish to give a new album name if I wanted to. So it's a very efficient way to manage publishing to social media. So. When I upload these multiple images to the blog, it's going to add them to the blog post in the order they were um, file named, right? And I have to decide which image is going to be the image that I want people to see from an um, index of images on a blog, because most blogs allow the user to look at them as a feed of each post having one feature image. I have to decide what that feature image is. In this case, I feel pretty good about this image being a feature image. It's visually interesting. This would be more of an established shot. This would be more of a detail shot. If I wanted to change it up, I would just cut and paste that in front of the other image so that that's the one that shows up if I publish that image. And I'm not taking the time to put the text in there. But if I go to View Blog, there's the standard blog view, but if I go into magazine mode, that feature image is going to be what helps people decide, oh, do I want to see what that is or not? So I have to decide what that image is um, that should be the, the cover that grabs their attention to look further. Now in this case, I'll go ahead and edit that, and I actually do think this other image is more interesting. Oops, grabbed the wrong one. The other thing I want to do is I want to control the size of the images. So I will click on this image and I'll set it to be large. And I can set this one to be small. It's not that important. Okay. And I can set that one to be a little bit larger. And maybe I go ahead and put that in front of that other one. I've got some choices how I publish these images. And now if I look at the blog, and I go from the standard view to the magazine view, now I will see, and then whatever text would show up in this space here. Okay?